Uh, so this set of notes is about calculating energy and also about using energy to solve physics problems. So being able to calculate an amount of energy of one type is a tool, but it's not a it's not useful until you use it to solve problems. So we'll show how to use the different forms of energy, the calculations in solving actual physics problems. Um, we'll do the major forms of energy in physics, at least in these types, this level of physics, where we have kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy. And then also, uh, we'll, I don't think any of the, well, no, there is one, I guess, that uses thermal in the upcoming notes. Um, so thermal energy is sort of a, a final resting place for energy. Usually it's not considered useful after it turns into thermal. And then we'll also talk about work, which is the transfer of energy between objects. Um, yeah, we'll get to work in the notes. Uh, first one is kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of an object is related to its speed in some sort, some sort of reference frame. So if you pick, if you say a car is traveling at 60 miles per hour down the road, you're assuming a frame of reference. It's relative to the surface of the road, which is the surface of the earth in a sense, unless you're on a giant treadmill. However, um, if you're in a space, like a situation out in space, it's a little hazier. You have to be a little more explicit with your uh, declaring of a frame of reference. So you might have two asteroids that aren't moving relative to each other. And then you'd say, well, if they're not moving. They don't have kinetic energy. However, relative to something else, they may be moving really fast. So maybe relative to Jupiter, they're traveling together really fast. So now from Jupiter's point of view, they have a lot of kinetic energy. Um, on Earth, if you have two cars, a 30 mile per hour car and a 60 mile per hour car with their masses being equal, the 60 mile per hour has four times the amount of kinetic energy as the 30 mile per hour. So it will take four times longer to stop if you were to try to stop with a 60 mile per hour car versus a 30. Also, if you get into an accident with a 30 mile per hour car, you'll suffer a small uh, a collision. Um, but with a 60 mile per hour car, you might total it, might total the car. It gets really more noticeable or extreme with the greater difference in speed. So like at the bottom here, uh, if you're only traveling at 10 miles per hour, that would be a minor dent in the fender, in the bumper. Uh, but if you were traveling at 60 miles per hour, that might total your car. The, the 60 mile per hour car has 64 times more kinetic energy to get rid of. And usually that means deforming the car. So the, the frame of the car in the act of deforming, of crumpling, absorbs the energy and turns it into heat. So it's good to have crumple zones. It's good that your car is totaled. In the Back in the day when they made cars to last, uh, they didn't engineer in crumple zones. So the car might get into a really bad collision traveling fast, but because it was made of steel and it didn't crumple, um, it didn't absorb any of the energy and therefore the people inside suffered the consequences. There's additional ways to look at that, but that's a general way of looking at it. Okay, so kinetic energy. To calculate kinetic energy, it's one half times the mass in kilograms times the speed of the object in the reference frame squared. The mass has to be kilograms and the speed has to be meters per second. And if you do that, then your answer in, for energy is in joules. Okay, example problem. So we have these three balls. They all have the same size, mass, and shape. Um, but are traveling at different velocities as shown. Um, I would say that this saying, saying that it has the same mass, um, they have a typo. Okay, 
So ignore the same mass part. We'll go with the uh, mass as listed. All right, so we're looking at kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half m v squared. So for this first one, it would be one half of four kilograms times two v squared. For the next one, it's one half of two kilograms times four v squared. And then for the last one, it's one half of two kilograms times four v squared. The dis difference in direction doesn't matter. Kinetic energy is a scalar. All right, so we'll multiply all the numbers out. Two squared is four. So we get one half times four times four, which would be two times four or eight. And then that's eight kilograms V squared. Uh, v just represents the units for velocity. All right, four squared is 16. 16, one half of two is one, so one times 16 is 16 kilogram V squared. And then this one is 16 and one, so it's again 16 kilogram V squared. So it looks like B and C are equal and they're greater than A. Okay, so Next, a gravitational potential energy is in a way similar to kinetic energy in that you have to have a, a frame of reference that you pick to be zero. So like the frame of reference of the earth, if a car was sitting still on the road, it's not moving relative to the surface of the earth. So that's zero kinetic energy. In this case, we have to pick a height. So this is a position in a gravitational field. If we pick the surface of the Earth as zero gravitational energy, then any height above that would be positive gravitational potential energy. Any height below that would be negative gravitational potential energy. So where you pick your zero point matters. Uh, the equation then it, for the gravitational potential energy is mass times the field strength 9.8 newtons per kilogram for the earth and then times the height in meters. So if you use kilograms, newtons per kilogram and meters, then the energy works out to be joules. All right, next example. Uh, shown below five stacks, each stack contains three blocks. The mass of the blocks are given and the mat, the mat in, uh, in terms of m, which is the mass of the smallest of the masses. Each block has the same height, so the thickness, uh, the height of the block, meaning the thickness of the block, is the same, and has the center of mass at the center of the block. Originally, all blocks were flat on the ground. Rank the work required to assemble each stack. All right, so for this one, gravitational potential energy is m times g times h. They're all going to have the same g, the field strength. They're all on Earth. The blocks, though, have different masses. They'll be lifted to different heights. And so we'll just do this in terms of mass and height and, in in sense, ignoring the constant for g, because they'll all have that same constant, that 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Another thing is, is that since these blocks started at ground level and they are still at ground level, they don't have any gravitational potential energy. They're all zero. So the bottom blocks for each of these have zero joules. So all we have to worry about are the blocks that had to have been lifted to get on top of those bottom blocks. Now, it didn't make any difference because they were all one mass at the bottom. So even if we had accidentally somehow added them in, it wouldn't have changed the order. 
Okay, so let's move on. Um, this one is lifted up to a height. Um, we could just say that the height of one block is h. So 5m got lifted up to a height of h. Now for the other one, it got lifted up again, another h to get up to this height. So this one got lifted up m times 2h. Again, m times h, and we're ignoring the g. So for this stack, we have a total of 7mh. Okay, the next stack. Uh, this one gets lifted to 1h, and this one gets lifted to 2h. So we have 3h plus 6h, or 9mh. Then over here, the first one was 4m to a height of h, and the other one is 2m to a height of 2h. So we get 4mh and 4mh, so it's 8mh. And this would be 2mh, and then the top block would be 4m to a height of 2h. So we get 2mh plus 8mh, or 10mh. And then finally, m to a height of h, 5m to a height of 2h. So we get 1mh plus 10mh, or 11mh. So this was A, B, C, D, E. So it looks like E wins. It's greater than D, greater than B, greater than C, greater than A. All right, moving on. Okay, work is the transfer of energy from one object to another. Um, objects interact with forces. And so if there's an interaction and that interaction results in a change in the other object, then we would say that the, the object had done work on the other object. And if that, that might end up as a change in its energy. Um, if there was no other forces acting on that other object, then it would definitely end in a change of energy with the of the second object, the object where the uh, so even though each object feels the same force, we typically look at a single object and we talk about the energy of that object. If you have two objects out in deep space and you think of it as that's the system, the two objects far away from anything else, any gravitational field or whatever, um, the, the two objects might apply a force to each other, but it won't be able to change their collective velocity. It won't be able to change their collective position in space um, because it's all internal actions. There's nothing to change the uh, total overall energy of the system. So uh, when we're talking about work, we often talk about work from something that's not in our system. And that would actually change the energy inside of our system. So objects could end up traveling faster and with, because they had more energy than the system had to begin with. Or it might, the work might take away energy. So you could have something outside your system um, fighting the motion of the object, therefore slowing it down. Okay, so there's an equation to calculate the amount of work done during an interaction on an object. From the point of view of that object, if it gains energy, that would be positive work. And then if that object is losing energy, that would be considered negative work. Now, because the force was coming from something else, we would say that the other object, that something else, 
was doing positive work on our object or was doing negative work on our object. So the earth would do positive work on a falling rock because it's increasing the velocity of the rock. It's speeding up, it's gaining kinetic energy, it's positive work. If the rock was originally thrown upwards and the earth was pulling it downwards, therefore slowing it down, uh, we would say that the earth is then doing negative work on the rock. It's removing kinetic energy. Um, now it's stored in a, if you take the earth into account and add the earth into your system, then you could say, well, the energy is still in the system. It's in the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy of the rock. So it gets kind of complex. You have to define systems. Um, if it's an external force, then the energy actually leaves the system. Um, but that's why we almost always include the ground, the entire earth, when we talk about uh, things changing height, so that uh, we can just say it's stored in the system as gravitational potential energy. The direction of the force versus the direction of displacement matters. So if the force is in the direction of motion, then that's positive and positive work. You would use a theta, an angle of zero in the equation for work. So the equation for work being force times cosine theta times the displacement, the distance traveled. Um, the theta represents the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of the displacement. So if they're in the same direction, theta is zero. If they're opposing each other, if they're in opposite directions, theta is 180 degrees. If the force and the direction of motion are at right angles to each other, then the angle could be 90 degrees, it could be 270 degrees. Now it could be any angle in between too, but just to keep things simple, if you have theta equals zero, then work done is force times distance. If theta equals 180, then work done is negative force times distance. It's negative work. And then if the theta is 90 degrees or 270 degrees, then there's no work because cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So there's often a joke where um, it's to drive home the point that the angle matters with force. But um, if you're out at a restaurant in the future, and the uh, waiter carries a tray of food over to your table at a constant height, the waiter's not doing any work because the force that the waiter is applying to the tray is vertical, straight up and down. However, the tray is moving horizontally. Those two are at 90 degrees to each other, the direction of the force and the direction of motion. So you could argue that you wouldn't have to tip your waiter because they're not doing any work. Of course, it's not true. They have to lift the tray. They have to set the tray down. There's forces in directions of motion there. Okay, an example problem. So this was A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right, so work equals force times cosine of the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of motion and times d. So in this case, theta equals zero. In this case, theta equals zero. In this case, theta equals about 45 degrees, maybe. In this case, theta equals 90 degrees. In this case, theta equals 180 degrees. And in this case, theta equals 270. You could say 90, I don't care. So that means that the cosine term is gonna equal one. In this case, the cosine term is gonna equal something between one and zero. So we could just come up with something like 0.6. Um, in this case, the cosine term is going to be equal to zero. 
90 degrees, cosine of 90 is 0. Uh, in this case, the cosine term would be negative 1. And in this case, again, the cosine term is going to be equal to 0. So the amount of work for A would be the force times 5 meters times 1. So force times 5 meters times 1. For B, it would be the force times 10 meters times 1. Uh, for this one, it would be the force times 5 meters times about 0.6. Uh, for D, it would be force times 10 meters times zero. For E, it would be force times 5 meters times a negative one. And then finally, for For F, um, it would be the force times 5 meters times 0. All right, so ranking these, um, this would be just getting the numbers out in front. This would be 5. This would be 10. This would be somewhere around 3. This would be 0. This would be negative 5. And this would be 0. So in order of greatest to least, it would be B is greater than A is greater than, um, and this is taking that the um, Let's start over. Okay, so from greatest to least, we're going to take the absolute value of the, the work. Because the, the negative sign just indicates whether the energy is flowing out or in. So we'll take the absolute value. So the one with the largest amount of work would be B. Next comes A and E. Um, next comes C. And then we have two at zeros. D and F are at zero. Okay, let's move on. Okay, next example. A block is pushed at constant speed up a ramp from point A to point B. The direction of the force on the block by the hand is horizontal. So the hand is pushing straight horizontal, not in the direction of the ramp. Uh, there is friction between the block and the ramp. The distance between point A and point B is one meter. The work done by the block on the block by the hand as the block travels from point A to point B. Um, so the hand is pushing in generally the same direction that the block is moving. It's not exactly the same direction since the block is going up the incline and the hand is pushing purely horizontally, but it's at an angle between zero and 90 degrees. And therefore, the cosine term is going to be positive, And that gives us a positive amount of work. So the answer is C, positive. OK, next question. Same situation. The work done on the block by the normal force uh, uh, from the ramp uh, as the block travels from A to B. So the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. 
it's pushing the block at an angle perpendicular to the, the slope of the ramp. Since the block is sliding up the ramp and the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp, that means even though there's a force, none of it's in the direction of motion. So that means the normal force is doing zero work. So the answer is A. Okay, next example. The work done on the block by the friction force as the block travels up from A to B. So friction is opposing the sliding, which means it's got to be pointing opposite the direction of motion. Our cosine term is going to be a negative one. So that's going to make our work done by friction be a negative. And then the last one, the work done by the Earth's gravitational field as the block travels. So since the Earth is pulling downwards and the block is moving at an angle up the ramp, then the angle between the direction of gravity straight down and the direction of travel, the angle would be here, or I guess better to describe it as this, which means it's greater than 90 degrees, but not quite 180. So cosine between the values of 90 and 180 um, is an increasingly negative value. So maybe a negative 0.2 or something like that in this case. It seems to be a shallow ramp. So that means that the work done by gravity in this case is negative. Okay, next example. So you get a triangle here where the area of this triangle is one half base times height. So you have a, a base of 10 and a height of 10. So this area would be, would be one half of 10 times 10 or 50. And that's what this 50 joules is. So Newtons times meters is the same as joules. And then when you do this rectangle, starting at 10 going to 30, it's just base times height, and so you have a base of 20, a height of 10, and therefore this is an area of 200 Newton meters or joules. And then finally this triangle, which has a base of 10 and a height of 10, so one half of 10 times 10, which is 50 Newton meters or joules. So 50 plus 200 plus 50 is 300 joules. All right, next, um, elastic potential energy. This is the energy that's stored in a, the, the spring. Um, if you have a spring at its rest length, it won't do anything. It can't make any changes to other things around it. If you compress the spring or stretch the spring away from its rest length, um, then, if you let go, it'll go back to its rest length. And in, the, in doing so, it would be applying a force to something if you had it, had it actually attached to something else. So that force would be doing work on it, the other object. You can use a spring to do work on other objects. So since you would be able to do that, it's known as potential energy. So you compress a spring or stretch a spring, it has this stored elastic potential energy because of the deformation and its tendency to return to that original length. Uh, clay doesn't have elastic potential energy because if you were to deform it, it just stays deformed. It doesn't spring back. It doesn't return to its original shape. Super balls, on the other hand, return to their original shapes. Um, steel ball bearings even more so. So if you drop a steel ball bearing onto something that can take it, uh, the steel ball bearing will bounce higher than a super ball. Um, the super ball will deform before the floor de deforms, whereas uh, a steel ball bearing might deform the floor where the floor won't spring back. So that's when this ball bearing doesn't appear to bounce up back as high. 
it's because the floor acted as it, something that didn't store elastic potential energy. But if you bounce a steel ball bearing off of, let's say, a metal plate, the steel ball bearing will bounce up higher than a Super Bowl. The equation to calculate elastic potential energy depends on how strong the spring is and how far it's stretched or deformed. So the equation is one half times how strong the spring is, the spring constant known as K. This K has a value in Newtons per meter. So the more you stretch it, the more Newtons you get. And then the X is in units of meters. So if you multiply that all out, newtons per meter times meters squared, you get units of newtons times meters, which is the same as energy joules. When you stretch a spring, the force gets more. So if you were to plot the force versus stretch, you would get a straight line. And then if you were to find the area underneath that line, you're basically finding the area of force times distance. So that then is energy. Force times distance is energy. So the calculation for the elastic potential energy of a spring is one half, because it's a triangle, times f times x and then we'd substitute in the equation for the force of a spring which is k times x so you would get one half k times x times x and that gets us our one half kx squared equation for the energy stored in a spring all right next example the figures below show systems consisting of a block attached to a spring. Each block is resting on a frictionless surface. In each case, the student pulls the block and stretches the spring to the right by the distance given. The mass of the block and the force constant of the springs are also given in each case. Rank these systems on the basis of the work done on the block spring system by the student. We're going to have to make a few assumptions that the uh, block was moved at a constant speed. The kinetic energy of the block was never changed. So the uh, total amount of work that the student does goes into stretching the spring. Okay, these are our six systems. The elastic potential energy of a spring is equal to one half kx squared. So the one-half term will be in all of these. We can ignore the one-half. Uh, we can't ignore the K or the X, but in the original question, they gave us the masses of the blocks. Uh, we don't care. We're not going to say the, the mass of the block doesn't affect how much energy is stored in the spring. Okay, so... Um, how about if we do this? How about if we throw the one half in there? So this becomes one half of five times 0.4 squared. This is one half of five point two squared. One half of four. 0.2 squared, one half of one, 0.5 squared, one half of four, 0.5 squared, and one half of one, 0.5 squared. All right, so uh, this
this works out to be 0.4. This is 0.1. This is 0 0.08, and I'm the units are uh, joules. Um, this one works out to be point one two five. This is 0.5. And 0.125. So the greatest amount of work would be our E. Um, next comes A. Then we have a tie, D and F. Um, and then B. Oh, and then C. I think that's all of them. Okay. All right, thermal energy is the random motion of particles. We measure thermal energy as temperature. Thermometers rely on the expansion of the material to be linear. Um, that doesn't have to be if it's a more complex device, but thermometers rely on the expansion of the fluid inside of them to be a linear relationship with the temperature. Um, if it wasn't, then the markings would have to change in their spacings between them. So, uh, they're they're generally it's very close to linear over the range of temperatures uh, that we're used to and then uh, heat isn't the same as thermal energy heat is a process heat is the transfer of thermal energy so our sense of temperature relies on this if you were to touch two different objects at room temperature you might say they have vastly different temperatures, even though they've been sitting in the same room for days. They have the same temperature as the, the room air. Uh, if you've ever touched the insulating foam that they put inside of walls, it, it, you'll find it feels warm. Or if you touch a chunk of metal, uh, you'll say it feels cool or possibly even cold even though it's sitting at room temperature before you touched it. The reason for that is that our bodies are used to sensing the flow of heat. And therefore, if you touch something that doesn't absorb any heat, um, it's almost like you're touching another person at, at their temperature. There's no heat flowing from you into the foam. And the only way that would happen normally, if you were talking about something that could absorb heat, it would be that it's at the same temperature as you. So touching foam is kind of like touching your your own arm. Um, it's at the same, you would think it's at your temperature, even though it's at room temperature. Uh, touching a piece of metal, metal absorbs heat very, or the, the flow of heat gets absorbed. So the uh, temperature of the metal would rise and it can absorb, you know, metals can absorb a lot of heat. So that's why it feels cold is because your thermal energy is flowing into the metal and therefore your body says, oh, that feels cold. Okay, we're going to move into how do we use this in physics? these different forms of energy to solve problems. So when do you use these ideas of energy? It's often when you have some beginning situation, something happens, 
and then you have an ending situation. So you have a change. You have an initial condition, then a final condition. Energy, the, using energy to solve the problem might be a good idea. It's not always. You could probably solve uh, many of the very simple kinematics problems just by using uh, the kinematic equations. However, um, when you get a little more complex, it becomes very difficult to solve those equations for uh, where you have a changing direction of motion, um, you have uh, the object uh, experiencing different accelerations at different times. Um, anyways, uh, if the situation gets any more complex than a, what we experienced when we went through this, the beginning kinematic equations, uh, usually energy is a better option. It gets to the answer quicker with less work. You know, pardon the pun. So the basic idea is you want to identify all possible forms of energy in the initial situation. So define your system, identify all objects that may be interacting with each other and identify the energies they contain. Then decide if there's something that's acting from outside of that system and therefore possibly putting extra energy in or taking energy out and then identify what are the all of the forms of energy in the ending situation. With that information, you can create an equation. The equation takes the general form of all of the forms of energy you start with plus any positive or negative works being done on your system equals all of the ending energies, the sum of all the different places where energy might be afterwards. And that's known as conservation of energy. Okay, so this example, a uh, block is pushed up, so up a smooth frictionless ramp from A to B. Uh, complete the qualitative energy bar diagram below for the earth block system as the block moves from A to B. All right, so we start off with this block moving from A to B, being pushed by a hand. in this direction. The forces acting on the block are, let me get rid of that arrow, it's moving in this direction. There's the force of the push, and then there's the force of gravity. The block is, smooth, is pushed so that it moves smoothly up the ramp at a constant speed. So it's going to have some starting kinetic energy. We'll say three blocks. When it gets to B, since the speed was constant, it has to have the same amount of kinetic energy. So we'll just say it's, it ends with three blocks. We'll pick the height at A as gravitational potential energy equals zero. So at this, we'll say it has no gravitational potential energy to begin with. And then at the end, it's been lifted by some height, H. So now it has gravitational potential energy. Let's say it has two. Now there's no uh, springs, so no elastic potential energy to start with. And you can make it, to make it more obvious, you could put an X here to say none. It's in case you couldn't make out that there was a flat line there, just put an X. And then over on the elastic potential, there's still no spring, so there's still none. Now the equation says that the uh, initial energy 
plus work is equal to the ending energy. Now, this would then say that we have 3 plus 0 is equal to 5. So that can't be true. So what must be happening? There must be additional energy wrapped up in work. So then this becomes 2, and the equation checks out. It's true. It's an equation. So what's doing that work? Well, it's the hand. So the hand is doing external work. All right, next one. A 100 Newton box is initially moving upwards at four meters per second. A student is applying a vertical force of 80 Newtons to the box as shown. Okay, so the situation, a uh, person is pushing on a box. The change in height of the box is one meter in the upwards direction. The zero gravitational potential energy line is set at the height of the box, the, the starting height of the box. And we're to complete the bar graph for the earth box system as uh, when it moves upwards by one meter. Okay, so they gave us a starting kinetic energy. We're going to have to, in a sense, translate that into joules. So we're told that this is four. Now, how much kinetic energy um, would this um, four meter per second velocity box How much kinetic energy would that box have with four meters per second of velocity? So the initial kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So it's one half times the mass of the box, which is 10 kilograms. A 100 Newton box is the same as 10 kilograms. And then the speed is four meters per second squared. So that's equal to 80 joules. So each of these boxes represents 20 joules. Okay, next. So the uh, initial gravitational potential energy is zero. This internal energy could be anything that would possibly be a, a way of getting energy out of the object. So oftentimes you could say the internal energy of the object would be like chemical potential energy. Um, if there was nuclear energy in the box or in the, in the object, uh, those types of things where it is possible to get energy from something that's stored in the box. Um, I don't think there is any, in this case, there aren't any batteries or nuclear reactors inside our box. So we'll say there's no internal energy. And then the last category is the elastic potential energy. So the we're talking about the earth box system. The, the hand is outside of that. I don't think we can reasonably say that the box contains a spring. Okay, the uh, ending energy, 
So we're going to have to do a calculation for the gravitational potential energy. The ending gravitational potential energy would be the mass of the box times the field strength of the Earth times the height it was lifted to. So the mass of the box times 10 newtons per kilogram times the height of one meter. So that would be 100 newton meters or joules. So if each box represents 20, that means we have five boxes. So the ending gravitational potential energy has to be five. I would again argue there's no spring, there's no hidden battery, but now how about the kinetic energy? We can't say it's 80, it's not four boxes, or at least we're not sure. Um, let's look at the middle. Q stands for the heat. So is the box or the system, the earth box system heating up? Might be, but it's not useful for us to think of it as that way. So let's say that that's zero. Now for the external work, this would be the hand. How much work could the hand be doing on our box? So the external work due to the hand is going to be the force times the height times cosine of the angle between the two directions where that the hand is pushing up and the box is moving up. So it's going to be cosine of zero. So it's just going to be force times height. The force is 80 newtons. The height was one meter. So that's 80 joules. So the, the hand had to have put in four boxes. So if the initial energy plus work plus the internal energy of the heat is equal to the ending, the final energy, then we currently have 80 joules plus 80 joules is equal to 100 joules. That's not right. So there's something missing here. This is 160, so we must have had three boxes or 60 joules worth of work. So that this then becomes 160. Now you could actually use this to calculate how fast the box is moving. So kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. We want to get v, so we'll move everything to the other side. It becomes two times the kinetic energy divided by the mass and then square root. So two times 60 joules divided by 10 kilograms square root, and that's equal to the velocity. So it's actually moving at 3.46, or it's about 3.46 meters per second. Okay, next example. Okay, we have Buffy tossing a 0.5 kilogram or 5 Newton water balloon into the air where she's using 20 joules 
of work, of, of energy to do that. At the top of the arc, the water balloon is moving at 5.48 meters per second. So the question is, is how high did the balloon rise above the initial starting point for that to be true? We're given the uh, initial energy graph where it's not moving, so there's no kinetic energy. Um, we'll pick zero gravitational potential energy to be at the height that the balloon starts at. So that's also zero. The elastic potential energy, uh, we'll say there's no spring in our system in the water balloon. The water balloon isn't compressed such that it will uh, spring back. And then uh, uh, thermal energy, we'll just say there's none to start with. It doesn't, it's not useful to give it a value. Now, Buffy puts in 20 joules by throwing. So this is, these two boxes represent 20 joules of external work. And then the balloon has a speed at the top and it's got a uh, raise in height above where, where it started, where we called zero. So it has two forms of energy to end with. So the equation of initial energy plus external work equals final energy becomes zero plus the work of Buffy equals kinetic energy at the end plus gravitational potential energy at the end. So we'll plug in the values that we have. Um, the work of, that Buffy did was 20 joules. That's easy. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy, we'll have to use our equation for kinetic energy. So it's one half of 0.5 kilograms times 5.48 meters per second squared. So that comes out to be 7.5 joules, approximately. The equation for gravitational potential energy is m times g times h. So we'll plug those in. All right, so move the 7.5 to the other side. We get 12.5. And then we have the MGH here. The mass was 0.5 kilograms, and the eight or the G is 10 newtons per kilogram. So if we divide by those, we get 2.5 meters of height. Okay, so next we'll talk about uh, something called the work energy theorem. I tend to call it the work kinetic energy theorem. What it says is if you have an object where different things are doing work to it, then the sum of all that energy, the, the work, will end up as kinetic energy. So how could that possibly be true? Um, if you throw a ball up into the air, you're putting energy in by giving you know, your chemical potential energy to the ball by throwing it. And then it rises up into the air, therefore, doesn't it gain gravitational potential energy? Didn't your work turn into gravitational potential energy? Um, well, kind of, but the gravitational potential energy comes because of a relationship with the Earth. So you may throw energy into the ball by using your chemical potential energy and converting that into the, the throwing of the ball into the air. But then as it goes upwards, the earth is doing negative work on the ball. So your positive work plus the negative work done by the earth because of gravity, when they balance out and become the equal but opposite, the sum is zero. How fast is the ball moving at the top of the throw? 
If it goes straight up, it's moving at zero meters per second. It has zero kinetic energy. So the, 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 the theorem works. You just have to be careful of how you apply it. So if you have multiple forces acting on an object and the object changes position, then the change in kinetic energy is equal to the sum of all the external works. Now, if the object doesn't move, even if the whole bunch of things are pushing on it, all of those external works are zero, therefore it still holds. The object just didn't move, it didn't change its kinetic energy because all the works were zero joules. Okay, example. A two kilogram cart starts at rest and experiences the following net force over the distance of six meters. What's the final velocity of the cart? All right, so the work energy theorem says that the sum of all the external works is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now the change in kinetic energy would be your initial kinetic energy, sorry, your final kinetic energy minus your initial kinetic energy. Now, our object isn't moving to start with. The initial speed is zero. That means the kinetic energy at the beginning is zero. So this goes away. So these two are equal to each other. And the equation for kinetic energy is one half mv squared. We're going to be doing it at the final time, so that's vf squared. So all now we need is this to find the total amount of work done, and then we can solve for the V here. All right, to get the total amount of work, we're going to use the area under the graph. Uh, we'll break this first bit up into a triangle and a rectangle. It's got a height of 2 newtons and a width of 2 meters, but it's a triangle, so it's uh, one half of four newton meters or two newton meters which is the same as two joules. This second bit has a height of two newtons a width of one meter so that's two newton meters. This is zero there's no force and then this bit it has a height of negative one and a width of two so negative two times one half is negative one joule. So this total amount of work is two plus two minus one, which would be three joules. And then that's equal to the one half MVF squared. So solving for V, we'll move everything else to the other side. It becomes two divided by m, and then square root. The m, our mass was two kilograms. So two times three joules divided by two kilograms. So that cancels. And then, so we take the square root of three. Which is 1.7 meters per second. All right, so let's go back. Okay. Okay, another another set of questions. I think this is it.
I think this is the last set of questions. Okay, a block is pushed at a constant speed up a ramp from point A to B. The direction of the force it by the, on the block by the hand is horizontal. The distance between points A and B is one meter. The kinetic energy of the block at point B is A greater than the kinetic energy of the block at point A, so B compared to A, uh, less than, equal to, or cannot be compared, unless we know the height difference. So here, the important part is to notice that the block is pushed at a constant speed. So the uh, kinetic energy has to be the same. If it sped up, the kinetic energy at B would be greater. If it slowed down, it would be less. But because it's going at a constant speed, it has to, they have to be equal to each other. Kinetic energy at B is equal to A, so the answer is C. Okay, part two. The work done on the block as it travels from point A to point B. So the net work is the change in kinetic energy, or the, kinetic, the change in kinetic energy is the net work. So in this case, since we didn't have a change in kinetic energy, there must be no total work done, no net work. So in this case, it's zero. A. All right, the last one. Uh, the work done on the block by the hand as it travels from point A to point B. Uh, first option is equal to one meter times the magnitude of the force on the block by the hand. That's not possible in this case because the hand isn't pushing directly in the same direction as the block is moving. Um, B is greater than one meter times the magnitude. So if it was the length times the force, then that would be where you're pushing completely in the direction of. That is the greatest amount of work that this person could do. So you can't do more work than that. Um, so it's actually impossible to get greater than the force times one meter if the block traveled one meter going from A to B. So B is literally impossible. It's, it's not physically possible. C is less than one meter times the magnitude of the force. That's true. The work done by the hand is less because the angle between the force and the direction of motion is between zero and 90 degrees. So cosine of something between zero and 90 degrees is a decimal less than one but greater than zero. So let's say it's 0 0.7, 0 0.8, I don't know. So he's doing like 70% of the maximum possible work. So C, the answer, it could very well be C. Uh, D is zero. Uh, know that the force is in at least somewhat the direction of the motion, so there is some work from the hand. And E is kind of like, well, I give up. So uh, C is the correct answer in this case.